first of all, let me say thank you so much to the university for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. How many people have ridden the tube or the underground in London? Hands up. How many people? Okay, quite a lot of people. Uh, and if so, this is not a real sign, but you probably recognize the feeling that you get from the tube, which is that you are actively encouraged not to make eye contact. It's not a very friendly place. Another question, how many people would feel comfortable without any particular reason going up and talking to a complete stranger in the middle of nowhere for no reason? One, a few people. Okay, thank you very much. Let's take a closer look at that person. Any more people? Any fewer people? <laughs> This is what I want to talk to you about today, because I think the process of getting past this gap, the gap that makes most of us a little bit uncomfortable going up and talking to a stranger, making eye contact on the tube, getting past that gap, I think, tells us quite a lot about virtual reality and especially about augmented reality, because I work across both mediums. So I'm a game writer. I started off in the traditional games industry, and I now specialize as a writer in virtual reality. I just finished working on the assembly. I've written titles for the, the major headsets and portable headsets, and I do a lot of consultancy with cinema people looking to do live action 360. But I also write and direct augmented reality experiences, specifically location-based, audio, immersive, iBeacon-driven, augmented reality theater. Now, that's a lot of buzzwords, which is why I decided we had to come up with a name for the group, the group of my colleagues and I who make these productions, so the name of our studio is Playlines. What we do is augmented reality theater in the strictest sense in that what you as a participant are interacting with is mostly the real world. And what we do is just add in a little bit, a little bit of a little bit of digital addition, a few tweaks to change your relationship with the reality around you and with the people around you. In many respects, in my work, I found the same things coming up across VR and AR. Now, I'm one of those people who believes that this distinction will only be meaningful for a few more years. I think relatively soon it will seem strange that we ever discussed virtual reality and augmented reality as separate technologies. But even now, even while these technologies are still very distinct, there's an awful lot that informs my work as a writer, designer, director, whatever, that is common across virtual reality and augmented reality. And I find that both of these fall under the banner of immersive storytelling, and the practice in one can inform the other one a great deal. Now, this is a huge topic, so today I just want to scratch the surface and talk about one specific topic today, and that's play. Now, those of you who go to game industry conferences or game academia conferences, I want to thank you for not groaning aloud because this word comes up a lot. This is the ultimate buzzword in gaming because the games industry, like academia, like any other industry, it goes in for fads. Things become fashionable. A few years ago, it was very fashionable in the games industry for everybody to read screenwriting manuals from the world of cinema. And so suddenly, as a writer, I couldn't conduct a conversation about what was supposed to be happening in a game story without talking about which story beat we were on and which story beat in Star Wars, the equivalent, the equivalent story beat we were on. This is useful up to a point, but it got to the point where you couldn't have a conversation about your game story without getting diverted off into an argument about who shot first. Now, this conversation always comes back around to play because this is the ultimate buzzword in the games industry. Because, and this is a useful thing. It keeps us focused. But it also means that you can win any meeting in a game studio simply by saying, I think we're losing sight of the player here. And then you can talk for a good 10 minutes about the socio-cultural implications of play before anyone remembers that you were supposed to be talking about what color the UI is supposed to be. But that's not what I want to talk about today, because there's another meaning of the word play, and I think that it's very instructive to consider this other meaning of the word play when we think about virtual reality and augmented reality. So I'm not talking about this kind of play. I'm talking about this kind of play. Flexibility or slack, the amount of give, the amount of the amount of flexibility between two objects, two connected objects, the amount that there is possi the, the possibility of movement between the two, and 
the idea that a connection between two objects or two ideas is not a direct, solid, hard line, but instead it has some play to it. And I use it in this sense because in VR and AR, especially now, I think our players are trying to calibrate themselves in terms of their distance from the simulation. They're trying to calibrate how they relate to the, to the simulation, how much freedom there is in the simulation, how real it is, and how many of reality's rules it follows. Now, our users can calibrate themselves quite comfortably to all different levels and kinds of reality, different ways of absorbing reality. And typically, what we aim to do in a game is keep the relationship between the player, the protagonist, and the simulation, we try to keep that relationship stable and consistent so that the player understands what they're getting and they understand their relationship to what's happening in the game or the simulation. But when you introduce an amount of flexibility, an amount of play between protagonist, player, and simulation, that's when things can get really interesting in VR and especially in AR. Now, I use the no eye contact example quite a lot because it comes up quite a lot in VR. You don't actually see this very often nowadays because the vast majority of VR demos don't include any human subjects in the simulation because, in most cases, the human in the simulation is the least realistic thing because humans are very, very hard to simulate. And you can take just one example, the case of eye contact, to see how hard humans are to simulate. VR sets up really high expectations for realism. And as soon as you have a character in the simulation who is unable to respond to too much eye contact in a way that feels realistic, then suddenly you know that you're not in a real environment. If you watch a user who is experiencing their first VR simulation, if there's a human figure in the simulation, you can see them trying to calibrate their relationship with the reality. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to break social rules, do things that are a little bit awkward, because then a simulated human can't cope with that, because they won't react in a way that's Sorry, mate. But that's an immediately obvious way of telling how realistic or unrealistic your simulation is. And this is because immersion is a fragile balance. It's very hard to build and it's very easy to break. Now, I don't need to tell you that one of the things that feels false about the approach we currently have to eye contact is that there is no ambiguity. Eye contact seems to be a binary condition. You are either making eye contact or not making eye contact, but you only need to ride the tube in London to realize that actually there is a lot of ambiguity within the idea of eye contact. There's a lot of different types of communication. There's a lot of different types of eye contact, and British people especially are masters of the eye contact that isn't really eye contact. And you can see that on the tube all the time. There's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of play. We're going to work out how to make humans work in VR. We're going to work out how to make eye contact work realistically in VR because we're going to have to have simulations that our users feel comfortable in and develop a stable identity in. As fun as it is, we can't confine our storytelling to lonely hedgehogs and robots forever. But that doesn't mean that playing with the user's calibration their social calibration with other people in the simulation, providing a bit of flex, can't be really useful and create really interesting effects. And that's where tweaking reality comes in. Making small changes to the user's relationship with reality. Changes so small that they're almost not there can actually create really large and important and useful effects. So, in the assembly, the virtual reality title that I worked on, there was a sequence that we were working on where one of the characters, you play two characters, one of, and, and one of the characters is being put through a series of trials, of tests. Now, some of these are classic puzzles, but some of these are more conceptual. They're more sort of tests of courage. They're tests of personality or character. That was really important to the story. And so we had to come up with something that would be challenging 
and would feel as challenging as a traditional block-moving puzzle, but which actually had no puzzle to it at all. It was an emotional challenge. And what we ended up doing was having a balance beam, a vertigo experience, in fact, where the user was challenged to walk across this balance beam over a, a, a scary-looking drop. But we'd also established in the story that the character, the protagonist, the person whose eyes you were seeing through, that character experienced vertigo. They had a fear of heights. So even if the player did not have a fear of heights, the character did. And we played around with all sorts of ways to communicate this. There was a lot of experiments done with when the character, she started walking out, or when the player started walking the character out across the balance beam, that we would put a warping effect on the vision, kind of like when you're struck by something in a lot of first-person shooters. You have a disorientation effect. We, might, we actually tried out doing a, adding a bit of wobble to the camera. All of these things added a lot of nausea to the simulation in a way that if you've worked with VR, you might expect. It was an an idea, and the idea was to make it feel like an unpleasant experience, but it resulted in things that in, for many users were so unpleasant that they just couldn't deal with it and they pulled themselves out of the simulation, deliberately closing their eyes, for example, or even taking the headset off. In the end, we ended up getting really good feedback about our use of vertigo and our creation of a sense of vertigo. We got really good feedback, and people said that it felt really unpleasant. They felt a new sympathy with people who actually experienced fear of heights. Except that in the end, we didn't have any simulation at all. We didn't do the camera effect. We didn't do the blur. We didn't do the wobble. All we had was the voice of the character sounding like she was afraid. All we had was that emotional component, the storytelling component, heavy breathing, the sound of panic, swearing under her breath, all sorts of little elements, but it was purely in the script and in the performance by the actress. And we got these great responses because the users did the vertigo to themselves. We left a gap between the player and the protagonist and the simulation. We left some ambiguity and flexibility and play. We didn't try to fill it with specific simulation. We left a gap. And users brought themselves up to the level and experienced vertigo themselves purely through having heard the emotional cues to do so, purely through having been given the emotional state of the person who they were embodying. And we got reports of people actually experiencing uh, uh, visual blurring effects, vertigo-esque effects. You wa we watched people doing this, even if they were sitting in a chair, because this wasn't a room-scale game. We could see people queasily bobbing back and forth, doing this simulation to themselves, even people who never experienced fear of heights before. And this isn't really a surprise to me, because I often do talks at virtual reality accessibility events, and people ask me what happens when young people get lost in the simulation and lose track of reality. And my answer to them is always, that's been happening for thousands of years. Immersion is nothing new. As a writer, I have to tell you that writers have been able to create total immersion for thousands of years using nothing more than these. And so the idea of just adding the tweak, the small change, the emotional state change, and that being a really powerful tool in creating a simulation, even a simulation where the, mo the majority of it is being very, very carefully, painfully, and expensively simulated, just a little change was enough to make a difference. And it, it's enough... But because words are at the core of what I do, that's why when I started working in augmented reality, I became interested in working with audio augmented reality, because that allows us to create immersion in a completely different way, but despite the fact that the user is moving around the real world, to create an immersion that feels really, really intense. So if virtual reality for me is about opacity, it's about replacing as many of the senses as possible with a completely simulated world, then augmented reality is about transparency, about overlaying a few elements onto your vision, your experience of the world. Now, mostly we talk about this. It's usually envisioned in terms of visual overlays, either using a camera feed, 
contact lenses in science fiction. This is how augmented reality is usually visualized. But with play lines, we work with, with augmented reality that's almost completely audio only. And that's exciting to me because it's augmented reality that is ready to go right now, that doesn't require very expensive holograms or very expensive overlay technology, but also because words are pretty much all you need to tweak the user's relationship with reality and get them doing pretty odd things. So this is a show that we did last month, which included, basically, we gave users a smartphone app. They plugged in some headphones. The smartphone went in their pocket, and they didn't even look at the screen. The simulation didn't demand that they looked at the screen. And they walked around a venue, a venue that we had seeded with eye beacons, which are about like that, which send out a passive Bluetooth signal to the, the smartphone so we can locate them within the building, much more accurately than GPS. And with those few building blocks, we built up an audio narrative where you were listening to a character who was guiding you around the room. And this allowed us to create an experience which was very immersive and very personal because like any form of audio, like music, if you're walking down the street listening to your own soundtrack, then it's your own very personal experience of the world. But it also allows us to very quickly shift into something that's very public, because at the end, we essentially moved into a silent disco experience where everyone was listening to the same thing, in this case, music rather than voice. And so people ended up dancing in a small room. And so I managed to get my mum, who came to see the show, dancing, alert, dancing in a cupboard with a group of strangers. We managed to get people doing some very odd things with this simulation. But the strangest thing that we managed to achieve was on one of the storylines that took place within this geographical environment that we'd created. It was about a fictional, an augmented reality technology that allowed you to have somebody in your ear who would help you with social encounters. Kind of like a wingman. It was sort of a combination of Tinder and the movie Her. Or Tinned Her. So this person would be speaking in your ear and saying, oh, you see this person over there in the check shirt? They are really into dogs, and they seem like they would be a good person to date. Now, we had no way of knowing that there would be a person in a checked shirt nearby, except, of course, it was a technology festival, so we, it was a pretty safe bet there would be somebody in a checked shirt nearby. But at some point, this character who was speaking in your ear suggested you go and talk to the person in yellow. Now, this was an actor who we had put in the simulation. They sound really excited. They're saying, this person is ideal for you. This is a great person. You should just go up and talk to them, chat them up, say hi, start a conversation. But working with AR involves working with so much flex and play and ambiguity that it can be difficult to control. In the virtual reality example, the player had to cross the balance beam because it was our simulation. We could stop the player from progressing. We could prevent progress until they walked across the balance beam. But here, our play environment was the real world, with a few story tweaks laid on top. And so we couldn't force players to go and speak to the person in yellow. And lots of players didn't. Lots of players didn't get over the, um, the, the emotional difficulty. They didn't get over the awkwardness barrier and go and talk to them. And it was very amusing being able to sit and watch our users walk around and see who unexpectedly did get the courage up to go and talk to a stranger, and which very well-dressed people actually just loitered around and then chickened out and didn't go and speak to the person in yellow. It was also very interesting to see when we changed shifts between different actors who were playing the person in yellow to see who went and spoke to them and who didn't go and speak to them. It was very instructive about our audience. But the thing is, we, because we left that play in the connection, we had to build into the story the idea that if you didn't respond, if you didn't go up and speak to them, the story still had to cope with the idea that you did not, in fact, go and talk to them and adapt to it. It still had to make sense. The fact is, in video games, we're so accustomed to going and talking to people. In most video games, going up and saying hello is one of the lowest risk interactions that we can make. But in the real world, that's a high impact choice. It's a high risk choice to go and talk to a stranger. And I think. Just with the addition of some story elements, in this case, story elements communicated purely by audio, purely by a voice in your ear telling you to go over and talk to that person, it was possible to get people to cross that gap and to walk over that particular social balance beam and get over their social vertigo. 
So in VR, human interaction has suddenly become the most resource heavy, the most sought after, the most expensive thing in the business. Getting real humans in your VR simulation is going to be the next big developmental frontier. But meanwhile, augmented reality is giving us a bunch of new tools to get real human interactions going between people. And the best way to do it is to use just enough narrative to get the user telling themselves a story. If anyone here has played Pokemon Go and had a social experience while playing Pokemon Go and has found themselves surrounded by strangers who are also companions, who are also fellow players, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. In the case of the balance beam, the play was in leaving enough distance between player and protagonist that the player themselves created the vertigo. But in here, the play is even greater because we couldn't say anything about the protagonist at all. The player and the protagonist were the same person. So not overlaying too much and using just enough story became the key. Just enough to tweak their relationship and get them going up and talking to a perfect stranger. Because games are full of perfect strangers. But in the real world, there's no such thing as a perfect stranger. There's always unpredictability and flex. And so we have to include that unpredictability and flex and play in our simulations or they won't feel real because knowing exactly what's going to happen when you make eye contact with someone or talk to a stranger makes what you're doing feel unrealistic. And if you're working in VR or AR, that's what I invite you to experiment with. Give them a little bit more flexibility and you'll find that your simulation is always pushing to make itself feel more real than you might expect and more real than the player might expect. Thank you very much. So I got two questions from the audience. Thank you very much. And we have just time for one, so I'll choose the shorter one. <laughs> Have you thought about injecting players with emotive drugs such as dopamine or adrenaline? It would seem like a natural extension to the emotive narrative augmentation. That's a good point. And um, we've already talked about using um, olfactory stuff like smell. And actually, all of this stuff is really along a continuum. Uh, my job as a writer is usually to provide a cheaper alternative to just injecting the user with drugs. And God knows when I sit and watch in user testing and you don't get the reaction you want, there is always a real temptation to go up and just go, just, they need a bit more adrenaline in this. I, I guess what I'm interested in is where we can use words and story and narrative to assist our simulations and to stand in for things that would otherwise be more expensive, like having a sterile injection rig that's set up alongside your matrix chair, you know. Um, Yes, I have considered it in my darker moments. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you also.